Before we begin, I wanted to give a shout out to both the Combine Overwiki for the information and Skyclad for helping out in this video. In this video, we'll be going over three ports of Half-Life 2, one that was made for the Japanese arcade market, one for the original Xbox, and one for the PS3 and Xbox 360. The Japanese arcade port was called Half-Life 2 Survivor. It was released in June of 2006 and it was developed by both Valve and Taito, a Japanese company that specializes in games, toys and arcade cabinets. Before we talk about the game itself, the arcade cabinet built for Survivor was quite interesting. It had two joysticks and pedals, which led to a simplified control scheme. Now, the footage you'll see is the game running on my computer. It's not actually an emulation or a mod, but rather the actual arcade machine running on my PC. It's hard to explain, but run with me on this. It has this strange resolution hard-coded into it, so I couldn't change it. Plus, it doesn't allow you to change the controls either. There might be a way to do it, but I didn't find it out. When we boot up the game, after a cool looking intro sequence, you have to press F1 to enter credits, or in other words, add in the quarters, or the coins, or the tokens, whatever you want to call them. After that, press F2 and the game will begin. Now there's three modes to go through, story mode, battle mode, and mission mode. The story mode is the most bizarre one out of the three. It's the Half-Life 2 campaign split up into 10 chapters. I played 5 of these chapters and this is what I saw. So the game starts off as usual with the G-Man intro but with extra scenes in the background. Then this chapter title screen appears and the game starts off not from the train station but from the underground tunnel. So all of the beginning is either cut or shown through cutscenes. Next were the obnoxiously flow-breaking tutorials. Whenever I moved forward, I would get these pop-ups which would tell me how to play the game. The next obvious thing to note is the user interface. Where Valve tried for a very minimal HUD in the original game, this straight up looks like a bootleg version of Half-Life 2. You got the health, armor and sprint meter to the bottom left, weapon and ammo counter on the bottom right, level progress on the top right, time remaining on the top, and score on the top left. Seeing that score and timer in Half-Life 2 is so weird, but then again, it's completely normal for an arcade game, which this was. The text, hit, critical, and defeat show up when you shoot an enemy. Kill the last enemy in this level, and a loading screen appears. And a cutscene. Oh my god, they put a cutscene in my Half-Life? No! Then we're automatically placed in the next section with an SMG. So, I didn't notice any weapon pickups nor can you pick them up from fallen metro cops. Only ammo and health from the bodies or the boxes. Then there's another cutscene and a boss fight. I find it very cute how the game hypes this up as a boss battle, with a unique pop-up window and the red text background and all that, but the actual boss fight is just... By this point you may have gotten the idea of how Survivor works and why it is like that. It's hard to keep in mind that this is supposed to be an arcade game not something that you can play slowly and at your own pace. The level cuts and the shortening of the campaign is understandable with that context. But Survivor is without a doubt one of the most unique arcade games I've ever set my eyes upon. I've had my fair share of arcade games in the past where they would all be designed in a way that would perfectly suit the arcade environment. But this PC to arcade port is kind of a first for me. Another thing to note is that there are no puzzles in this version. The platforming sections were all cut and some other strange differences were made too. Like how the speedboat is slow, you can't shoot the alternative fire for the shotgun and there's no flashlight or zoom. At least in the actual arcade machine, this version I'm playing does have it. Would I recommend someone to play Half-Life 2 like this? Maybe? I'd suggest you check this out only if you're curious to see it but I see no other reason to seriously play this game from start to finish. Another weird change was that there's also no gravity gun in the Ravenholm chapter. You know, that chapter that was practically designed to be THE gravity gun chapter, but nope, it's plain old guns here. I give it a 0 out of 10. 
Also, when you reach this point, it straight up shifts you to the finale of the chapter. So everything that happens in between is cut. Oh, and also there's uh, there's no Highway 17 in this version. It's straight to sand traps. Ugh. In total, four chapters were cut, on top of the others being shortened. These are Point Insertion, Our Red Letter Day, Black Mesa East, and Highway 17. Oh, and the final section of Sand Traps is called The Fortress of Waterfront. I think I've had enough of this. Let's take a look at Battle Mode, the main highlight of the arcade port. So this was the 4v4 team deathmatch component of the game. The idea was, in the arcade, 8 players would get together on these cabinets and play the multiplayer mode. You can choose from 5 different classes male or female, and human and combine skin variations. So there's a lot of choice here. Each class has their own uh, weapons. The multiplayer component itself is fine. There's nothing too special about it in terms of gameplay. The only thing that is unique is the skins and classes. I tried three different matches and I always got the same map, so I'm not sure if there's any more maps on the game. When you kill an enemy, you can pick up their dog tag and I think that's how you score for your team. You can also play this with friends using Hamachi, but that was a headache I wasn't ready to dive into setting up. Lastly, there's the mission mode. It lets you play through three distinct quote-unquote missions. You pick the character you want to play as, select the mission, and play the game. The first mission is basically you needing to kill these antlion guards and collect gems from their dead bodies. Once you have enough gems, you'd pass the mission. Mission 2 is just destroying these zombie houses with explosives. It's kind of fun. You destroy all these houses and you pass the mission. Mission 3 is a run and gun type of level. Start from point A, kill a bunch of things in between, and reach point B. You pass the mission. Lastly, Survivor has some interesting model and content in it which was taken from the beta. To save you some time, there's the Molotov cocktail that was cut from Half-Life 2. You can use it with cheats in this game. There's also this official HD model of Gordon that can be seen in the cutscenes. There's also a sniper rifle which is based on the cut sniper rifle. The Combine Sniper model is actually the Mommy Thick GF, I mean the uh, Combine Assassin model. And the Combine Engineer textures are based on an earlier version of the Combine Soldier. So I think that's pretty much enough for Survivor. Let's move on to the Half-Life 2 port on the original Xbox. The Xbox port is quite impressive for its time. You see, when the PC version came out, it had the following requirements. But the original Xbox had the following specs. While the game runs at 480p, the footage on screen is in 720p due to my recording setup. So, it's definitely an impressive feat to pull off. Then again, the original Xbox also had Doom 3 on it, but that's its own kind of worms. Keeping the console specs in mind, the frame rate of the game is all over the place. The game targets 30 FPS but mostly stays in the 20 to 15 area, and even dips to single digits in its most intensive moments. For example, the coastal levels. Graphically, while the FPS might not be the best, it still has amazing visuals for a console that was much weaker than the PCs at the time. The texture quality, the lighting, it's all pretty good looking and there's not any other major cut corners. The port has quite a low view distance, occulting doors and windows with a black texture and a white fog over distant geometry. The chapters themselves are all present here, but they are split up in an odd fashion. For example, the introduction and the train station are both separate chapters. The game also features a checkpoint system which works like the other say, but much more frequently. Because this came out in 2005, it predates the orange box, so it doesn't have the updated models or lighting. That means it has the old Vault models, the old combined ball model, no HDR, and no shotgunner model. You get the idea. Overall, it's the closest version available today, without piracy, to the original Day 1 Half-Life 2 experience on the old engine. When I looked at this footage that Skyclad sent over, it reminded me of the time when I played Half-Life 2 for the first time back in 2004. We didn't have the most powerful PC at the time, so it was basically the same experience for me, visually. But the FPS were a bit better though. I was rocking an FX5700. Yeah. 
Now let's move on to the PS3 slash Orange Box port of Half-Life 2. It was ported by EEA in 2007 alongside the episodes, Portal and of course, the Hat game. It's much closer to the PC version if we compare it to the original Xbox port. So on my copy, the audio was a bit high pitched, which is kind of weird. Anyway, it features almost the same control schemes as the original Xbox port, including the cross weapon selection. This time around, the levels are exactly the same as they were on the PC version. While the 360 version got updates over time, for some reason the PS3 version did not. And like I mentioned before, the PS3 version also has some audio bugs which can even make some frequency crackle. If we talk about the frame rate, it aims for 30 FPS and actually sticks to it. Again, it somewhat has a bit of a lower view distance, but it's not that bad. And again, the visual looks pretty good, especially with the HDR added. While the PS3 version has nothing of the sort, the 360 version had trophies, which is the equivalent of the achievements on the PC version. A nice little feature is that you can also quick save and quick load by holding the start button. Back when it came out, people looked down upon the PS3 version because of the stutter, but honestly it's not that bad, especially compared to the original Xbox version we just looked at. You can somewhat do an ABH on this version, but because you have to mash the buttons it's not as effective as it is on the PC version. My first ever experience of playing Episode 1 was on this port on the PS3, and strangely enough, it had missing audio or bugged out audio, so I didn't go far with it. Still, it was nice to have on the console if you didn't have a PC back in the day. So there you have it, those were three ports of Half-Life 2. Hope you enjoyed this video and once again, thanks to Skyclad for helping out with this video and to the Combine Overwiki for the information they share with the community members. See you next time and thank you for watching.